So I think uh, eventually I'll write a formal response to the blog that I'm going to respond to now uh, extemporaneously. But I, I wanted to say a few things just off the cuff. Uh, so that, well, the topic at hand, consciousness, would be more uh, easily displayed. Because when we're dealing with writing, there's the possibility for uh, the the audience, the reader at least, uh, to be misled by logical accuracy. Uh, misled in the sense that the logical accuracy of the argument distracts from its phenomenological incoherency and uh, its inadequacy to our own immediate experience of being alive. Um, so I, I found this blog by a, a PhD student in neuroscience at uh, MIT and uh, he, he refers to me in his blog um, and uh, he's giving an argument to um, or in support of the idea that consciousness is reducible to the brain. Uh, he, he writes that um, he says, while we don't know the exact neural mechanisms that produce consciousness, we do know that the brain is necessary and sufficient for consciousness. And he says that this is irrefutable. Uh, and, and I guess when he says we, he's referring to uh, a particular group of, of neuroscientists, a particular group of uh, specialists who are privy to this unique knowledge about the nature of the human being. Uh, and of human consciousness, that it is in fact, um, you know, I'll use the cliche, nothing but neural uh, patterns, neural firings, neurochemical interactions. Um, and, you know, I would of course say, and have said many times, that the brain is necessary, but not sufficient for consciousness. Uh, all of our scientific knowledge about brain function, physiology, uh, neurophysiology, is um, interesting for the uh, researcher of consciousness and relevant, but uh, not explanatory. Uh, you know, when we're dealing with consciousness, we're in philosophical terrain. And certainly the findings, the empirical findings of natural science, of neuroscience, concerning the nature of the brain and its relationship to certain perceptual and motor and uh, cognitive functions, um, is important and relevant to philosophy. But I think it's, it's too easy nowadays because of the technological and economic influence of science for us to forget that truth ultimately and knowledge and the universe that th these are ultimately philosophical concepts that the scientific method as a way of empirically observing uh, the regular patterns the general tendencies of the natural world there, there are certain questions that this method can't even ask, much less answer. And, you know, philosophy comes in to attempt to ask these questions. And, you know, uh, many times a scientist will say that, well, science makes progress because its theories are falsifiable. They can be proven wrong, and over time, science seems to get closer to a more accurate picture of what's going on in the natural world, whereas philosophy seems to be uh, one idea after the next that doesn't ever um, lead anywhere. Uh, Alfred North Whitehead famously wrote that all of Western philosophy is the footnotes to Plato, so that everything that could be said was said in the beginning, and that the last 2,500 years are merely the rehashing of the same ideas. And in fact, a rehashing of the same ideas poorly understood. But I think this is uh, 
an incorrect or at least an incomplete picture or understanding of the history of philosophy. Uh, because I think philosophy is progressive and that all of um, you know, the um, philosophers who stand out to us historically are the sort of nodal points uh, in the evolution of consciousness. And it's not that these philosophers like Augustine or Descartes or Kant are creating new ideas which then filter back into society and change the world. It's more so that philosophers describe what's already happening to the human species at their particular moment in history. So while many philosophers do end up changing the world later, at the time, uh, they're really just trying to articulate as eloquently and uh, precisely as possible the actual nature of things as they are. The scientist is doing something uh, similar but more specific, uh, which is using the outward facing senses to gather measurements which can then be organized into um, theories which uh, imply testable experiments and you can get a whole uh, network of paradigms operating in this way. You know, a paradigm is, is an example that uh, builds a scientific field. So, you know, you can't have cell biology until you've got uh, the, the microscope. Uh, and, and the microscope and the methods developed for staining slides and um, cell cultures and um, microorganisms uh, creates or, or brings forth a certain perceptual world which can be studied using this method and all sorts of theories emerge out of this methodology but eventually a new technique or a new instrument is created which provides uh, for perceptual experience of and measurement of patterns of activity that weren't known of before and which contradict uh, theories which were assumed to be true prior to these new empirical discoveries. So, you know, science is always a network of shifting paradigms, paradigms which because of the nature of the human spirit and the human desire to know the natural world and to know, uh, to know our own nature, science continues to recreate itself and it's wonderful for that and perhaps unique among cultural uh, activities and then you know, science is continually calling into question its own paradigmatic foundations whereas you know philosophy is doing the same thing of course but philosophy is concerned with more than just empirical observation through the outward facing senses. Philosophy is concerned with the conditions underlying the possibility of the empirical observation of an external world. What is the nature of the human soul such that it is capable of scientific observation of the world? And this is a philosophical question. The, the neuroscientist isn't going to ask this question. The neuroscientist is, the neuroscientist is looking at an object, a brain, and uh, consciousness is an activity that is not objectifiable. Consciousness is what does the objectifying. Uh, you know, the philosopher is, is always trying to mm, catch thinking itself in the act. So it's trying, the philosopher wants to recognize his or her own contribution to the nature of reality, whereas the scientist just wants to observe the nature of reality. But I think when we inquire 
or introspect into the, the functioning of our own thinking, we see that this, this process of thinking, that, that is our own conscious activity of being some kind of a noetic identity, some kind of a mind, some kind of a thinking process. Uh, we discover that subject and object really are united in this, this thinker that we are. Now, the problem is we can't ever present this thinker to ourselves as an object because we are that thinker. And it is out of this thinker that subject and object as concepts both emerge. And the I, the thinker, which cannot be objectified and really can't be pointed at, uh, this is the source of the entire world process, both our interior subjective experience and our exterior objective uh, perception. These both emerge from this unified uh, transcendent self which we experience in every moment as that which makes possible our experience of space and time. That sort of noumenal um, point of emanation out of which every thought and every object, every th idea and every thing arises. So, you know, for the philosopher, the reason the philosopher gets frustrated with the scientist and the scientist tries to account for consciousness only in terms of empirically measured objects uh, is because the scientist has completely forgotten their own contribution to this knowledge. Uh, the, philosopher, the philosopher can't assume from the beginning that his method of knowledge is correct and accurate. The scientist has already decided on a method, and that method is not really up for debate. It's the scientific method. Uh, now, the philosopher doesn't deny that this method is valuable and um, accurate and as of yet uh, unsurpassed within its particular domain of relevancy. Granted, the philosopher is subject to the empirical discoveries of science, but the philosopher isn't therefore beholden to the scientist or the lackey of the scientist because the scientist's own uh, ability to know can call itself into question. So rather than just being a subject trying to know an object and taking its own ability to know for granted as the natural scientist does, the philosopher has to call into question that subjectivity which knows, has to call into question the being of the world. Uh, uh, you know, and what the nature of its existence is in relation to itself. What is the relationship between consciousness and the universe, between knowing and being? These are questions that science doesn't ask and shouldn't ask. It doesn't need to ask. But it's when we ask about these questions that we're trying to get at the essence of consciousness. And while neuroscience is relevant to this discussion, it's not at all sufficient. That is irrefutable. Um, all of our neuro neuroscientific knowledge can be accounted for with at least two theories. Um, one, which I think would be very premature, would be to say uh, what Steve Rodriguez has said that. We already know, science already knows, that consciousness is reducible to uh, neural mechanisms. But the other option is to say that the brain is some sort of, uh, instead of a computer, some sort of a radio receiver, which dips into an ever-present field of consciousness, expressing it in a particular form that is of the human organism, 